Hello there, welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship Cleveland. I'm Marshall Seikliff, that's Simon Gertson. It's time for the last round of action. We've worked our way all the way through seven rounds and this is the eighth. I'll, I'll tell you what, we've been watching Rob Pisano quite a bit here in the feature match area. In round number five, he played against Brian Brown Doohan. In round number seven, that was last round he played against Chapin. He's not done yet. If he wants to be undefeated coming out of this round for this entire day, he has to beat Reed Duke <laughs> to, to get there. They're sitting down in the feature match area in our primary table. Let's head on down. It's time for the last round here from Cleveland. Hello and welcome back to coverage here at Mythic Championship 1 from Cleveland. I'm Marshall Seikliff in the booth with Simon Gertzen, and we are ready for the last round of standard action here on day one. In the feature match area, we have from the United States, Reed Duke playing for Team Ultimate Guard Pro Team. You take a look at Reed. What a start for Reed Duke. He is 7-0, and 3-0 to his draft, 4-0 in standard. He's playing mono blue Tempo, his opponent on the other side of the table. Same record, Rob Pisano from Team Cardboard Live has been, he's had a very tough route to get here, playing multiple MPL members, Hall of Famers, that kind of thing. What about the matchup? We have not seen a ton of Esper control in the feature match area. Rob's kind of been the, the one leading the charge with that. He's playing a very different deck here, though. This is mono blue. Mm -hmm. uh, another very interesting matchup, and it really hinges on Curious Obsession. If Mono Blue Tempo gets down, an early creature uh, suits it up with Curious Obsession and gets to protect it, then things spiral out of control. On the other hand, if the Esper Control deck has those early answers, uh, especially for either the creature enchanted with Curious Obsession or the Curious Obsession itself, then uh, of course, we are still talking about Esper Control. It will take down the late game. You know, I'm curious about something right now, Simon. Why hasn't Reed played a card yet? Yeah, I think he mulliganed at least to six, maybe even five. Mm. So um, he has to take a bit more of a slower approach. And funnily enough, this is doable if you play mono blue. It's not like you have to have a Curious Obsession on turn two, although that's, of course, what you would like to have. You can still um, poke in here and there, play this kind of flash game. Oh, Pisano really aggressively countering here. I like that because it is difficult to utilize your mana um, when playing against Mono Blue. Yeah, he's going to use Absorb to counter this Merfolk Trickster and gain three life. And somehow Rob finds himself with five lands on the battlefield, nothing else of relevance, and he's at 23. Like, he's not going to ask for much more than that, although this could be a step in the right direction for Duke. And he's Marshall, got Tempest Gen. Mono Blue is not an aggro deck. It's a tempo deck. So the, the life total is not all that matters here. What mattered here, for example, was that Pisano had two mana to play for, pay for spell piece. Right, he played his land first, you saw that. And that Chaos Wrath uh, doesn't care about dive down. Right. These are the kind of things that, that we have to look out for. Okay, a replacement Tempest Gin, though, from Reed Duke. And once again, he has one mana left over for a dive down, potentially, if, um, if it's a spot removal spell. But no, it's just another Chaos Wrath. And look at that, there is a dive down and spell pierce in hand for Duke, but uh, Rob playing around spell pierce by playing that land pre-combat last turn and having it this turn and looking in good shape. I'm I'm not sure if Esper Control is truly favored here. Which which sounds crazy because You mean from this position? From or this position. Yeah. <laughs> really? It looks like he's dominating right now. It does, yes. But at the same time, he hasn't cast any card advantage spells. Okay. And it's going to be really difficult for him to resolve a Teferi. This means that mm. Duke, who is drawing less lands naturally, it can still enact this game plan. It's just as if we had skipped ahead in time a little bit. Ooh, look at this. How yeah. about a nice target for Kaya here? So Kaya's minus one um, means you can exile a non-land permanent that costs one or less, which is usually one. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, so either Terramander or Mistcloak Herald are being threatened here. It also means it's the first chance for Duke to use uh, a dive down, though. And that's what he's going to do. The dive down is going to serve double duty here as well. 
as a Terramander currently doesn't have a lot of food. That's the first thing in the graveyard that actually reduces that adapt cost on it. Another land here for Rob, perhaps. No, I wouldn't say flooding, but he has not missed a land drop yet. No, but something that he did here, which was, which was extremely smart, was to not cast Chaos Wrath. He had been playing around Spell Pierce the whole time, and then you have to keep doing it. Yes. Because otherwise, you're just giving that Spell Pierce the, the utility that it didn't have before. So even though even though it's sad, you, you know, you don't want to lose your Planeswalker, um, you, you, can't, you can't allow a Spell Pierce to counter that you're your key uh, spell there. What you can maybe think about is to allow Spell Pierce to counter um, a Chemistry's inside, though. I think they're counting to see if he uh, played a land that turn, perhaps. Oh, good question. Or maybe played an extra land that turn. He definitely ha no. He had um, he had Chaos Wrath with two mana up to pay for spell pierce, and then he paid a, played a tapped land. I'm pretty sure last turn. Mm -hmm. So one, two, three, four, two mana up, tap land, and then a land this turn. And the the judges also have access to the to the video feed, so they can confirm that. Yeah, it looks right to me. So they got that sorted, and Reed says, I'm going to take this uh, this opportunity to take Kaya off the battlefield. But Reed is going to need a little bit more, mm -hmm. and there is a Chemist's Insight for Rob. Is that something that Reed wants to fight over? Will Rob even cast it, um, given his respect for all, spell All peers? of the above. I think yeah. Duke, Duke has to fire off spell peeps, and Pisano can actually decide if he wants to allow uh, Duke to use it. And it's it's he's decided yes. It's definitely um, it's definitely the card you most want to get spell peers because you can still use uh, the second half out of the graveyard. You even though it looks like you have infinite mana, playing around spell peers every single turn is is a tough ask. Yes. Just if you if you start fighting about uh, over a Teferi, for example, and you you play Teferi and then absorb. Then Spelpia suddenly is, is live again. So yeah. it, it is it is really tough. So now he's going to go for Kaya's Wrath to, to sweep away <laughs> these two little creatures. But Reed is going to use Wizard's Retort to counter it. So he's maintained his board state. Rob's going to pass mm -hmm. the turn back. And one downside of allowing Spellpierce to get value is that you um, allow the mono blue deck to fill its graveyard. Mm -hmm. So suddenly the Terramander is threatening to grow which makes Teferi a lot less exciting. You you suddenly have to minus three on a Terramander, but then Miss Clock Herald is threatening to, to hit for the final for the final point. Yeah, and Reed's just gonna go ahead and pay the adapt cost for Terramander. Scary Terry jams into the red zone, same thing with the Miss Cloak Herald, and a nice little clock now for Reed. Who would you say is favorite now? Reed. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who could have seen that coming? It's it's funny how how it goes, but um, Pisano. No, you were right. The, the one the one card advantage card that Pisano cast uh, actually got countered, mm -hmm. right? And those um, those wraths didn't really have a, a backbreaking effect. And look at this. Rob's trying to get back into the card advantage game here. Uh, if he, he's if used he, a lot of these wraths, though, and he did all of this main phase, so he's basically saying, "Look, I'm digging." I'm not gonna use the turn where you're tapped out mm -hmm. to to do something because a single Teferi is just not good enough on this board. But next turn, I will I will hopefully have something. Reed smartly checking uh, Pisano's graveyard there. I think he probably counted the the number of Chaos Wraths that were already gone because that's the scariest card uh, right now. Ooh. Reed has decided that there is not another copy of Kaya's Wrath because he just runs out of Tempest Gin. Wow. Now he's basically going all in. Yeah, now he's all in because and there's a Thought Erasure on the stack. But this is this... <laughs> Reed just says it's an island. This is so brilliant about about somebody like Reed Duke, who is arguably like one of the best Magic players right now. Uh -huh. He He's just playing this... After a mulligan, he, he doesn't... He doesn't concede mentally, right? He just says, I will play to my best of my abilities, see how the cards line up, I know what's important, what isn't. And here, he, he's just understood that the chances of there being a Wrath are low enough that it's 
it's giving him the best chance of winning to just drop everything on the on the table, and he's once again getting rewarded for it. Now he did lose his Tempest Jin to Vraska's Contempt at the uh, on on that last turn there, but he's got Rob under major pressure now. A one turn clock. Rob has to find answers. This isn't one of them. No, and and Rob knows that Teferi is not good enough. This is the the key the key part of the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, he equation. needs Teferi like plus cast down mm -hmm. or something. He he's using Teferi as a oh he he pluses. That's Oh he knew what he knew what was on top because of scrying. Okay, okay. so he had the cast down. Because of surveil, he knew what was on top of And he is that. clinging to life here, but this could be hope for Rob Pisano. Absolutely. Because suddenly he's on two. And but Reed's out of gas. That that might be two points of life that um, Reed is not able to deal. So Teferi's going to send that Merfolk Trickster pack in. But that's a sign of weakness. If you have to minus Teferi yes. in that spot. He, he drew an absorb. Hmm. And that we could actually see a situation where... He absorbs his own spell. Yeah, where if Duke plays a spell, uh -huh. Pisano wins. Yeah. And if Duke doesn't play a spell... Pisano is somehow forced to, to create a way <laughs> to to use absorb here. Let's see what uh, let's see what Rob's working with. It's thought erasure in his hand apparently. Well, that's very absorbable. You got to do what you got to do. Indeed. There's there's another draw step and there is a, a Teferi. Teferi plus. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a game! Yeah, this is a game that started off with Reed doing nothing yeah. for uh, multiple after, turns. After having Mulligan, yeah. Three Wraths in the, in the graveyard. Some Esper decks only play three in the main deck, then they usually have a Cry of, uh, Cry of the Canarium, but four is, is definitely the, the default. But you can't play scared, uh, especially not with Mono Blue. I actually I have a lot of respect for, for Mono Blue players in general. I think it's um, deceptively hard to play mm -hmm. optimally. Yeah, quite a few of the t Ultimate Guard Pro Team players are running it this weekend. So draw step plus from Teferi, as you mentioned, I think could Pisano also give Pisano hope. But I are think we going to see it? He found a removal spell. Okay, let's see if he did. Yeah. He did. He found Mortify, and now all of a sudden is Rob pulling in the lead at twenty to one. It feels like he's just ahead now. Yeah. By the way. Um, Duke didn't cast Charter Course because of Absorb. Okay, he, he, he did hold it back, but now he must. He, now he has to, and uh, he knows that this is now slipping away from him. But it was, it was so smart of him to not cast that when he could have just... Seriously. You could have looked at this and just seen a card that says two mana, draw two cards. Right. But Duke looked at it and he saw it's two mana, your opponent gains three life. Incredible. Is this a turn where he draws the Trickster? He's got one coming either this turn or next. But now Teferi is going unchecked on a board. Yeah, this is a trickster turn with no, no pressure whatsoever here. And it looks like another a, a pair of removal spells in hand now for Rob. He can play Mortify or Cast Down on this trickster. And now it's just not fair, because Rob's drawn two cards a turn and Reed isn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, but there's a dive down to save the trickster. Allow me to respond. Wow, Vraska's Contempt. And he has Cast Down as well. Jeez, he drew a lot of removal spells on that last stretch. Reed draws a card and ships it back. land go from Rob, but he's in a beautiful position here with that Teferi fueling his hand. Looks like Reed immediately passed a turn back after drawing his card once again. Chemister's insight from Pisano. In this kind of spot, if you have your opponent at two, you can, you can dream about Sneaking in a trickster, maybe protecting it with a with a counter spell. 
on six, it's a lot more difficult. Also, uh, two Tempest Jins are already in the graveyard. That's the one card that's threatening lethal all on its own. Mm -hmm. But you can see here that Pisano is soon going to, to ultimate Teferi, and then Duke is just going to lose all of his permanents. Rob continues to tick upwards with Teferi, who's now on eight loyalty. And we're going to see an ultimate here. And as his custom, the follow-up Teferi. I'm telling you, every time. Every single time, Simon. I mean, maybe also because if you didn't have the follow-up Teferi, you just wouldn't minus eight at this spot. Think okay. about it. I don't want to. I just want to complain about it. Reed's going to continue to play, but this one has well and truly slipped away. Now it's two permanents per turn being exiled by that emblem. One from the draw step and one from Teferi. And of course, anything like a chemist's insight is just a turbo boost to that process as well. Have you ever double emblemed? Uh, Teferi? No. I, I don't think I've ever single emblemed Teferi. I, I think you're more on the, on the receiving end of Teferi emblems from what you're from You what got you're that saying. five, didn't you, Simon? <laughs> he just put a Teferi back on top of his library, by the way. Chemist's Insight is by far the, cast, the card I've cast most in this standard format. And Reed Duke is going to concede this one. He knows that there's no way for him to win the game. And look, they didn't spend too much time on that game, but 34 minutes left on the match clock. He wants to make sure that he has a good chance to win the two remaining games that he needs to win to stay undefeated here on day number one. So the march continues for Rob Pisano taking down Reed Duke here in game number one. But the match is not over yet. It will be up to Rob to consult his sideboard where ostensibly the matchup gets better for him. Uh, this is one of the big benefits you get from playing three colors versus a monocolor deck is that you have a lot of options out of your sideboard where Reed maybe uh, you know, will change his game plan a little bit, but we'll find out when we come back from that. We've got a little short break. When we come back, we'll have more live magic here from Cleveland. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Cleveland. We're here for the first Mythic Championship. I'm Marshall Suckliff in the booth with Simon Gertzen. You take a look around the feature match and see what's going on. We've got Marcio Carvalho on 10 life against, ooh, John Finkel. Hello. 
Looks like John's playing the same list that Reed is, or at least the same archetype. <laughs> but a lot going on on the board state here for Marcio. What does he have going on here? Well, he has the city's blessing. And what's his attack force actually, though? Because there's a lot of non-creature permanents on the battlefield here. Yeah, Snow Con Snow Conclave Horn Tribunal Century. and Bethlehem are not attacking. <laughs> Neither is his uh, history of Vinalia, nor his uh, city's blessing indicator. Interesting, interesting <laughs> life total situation uh, with the, the score of 1020 telling us effectively the history of this game, which uh, means that John got in for all the early damages until uh, losing probably, yeah, his his two relevant creatures, Tempest Jane and probably the uh, enchanted uh, Mistlock Herald to, to those uh, auras. Some of the, the finest players in the world right now choosing to go with Mono Blue. Yeah. Alexander Hain, also in the MPL, uh, got number one Mythic with the deck. Mm -hmm. Doesn't play it this uh, this weekend. He didn't play it this weekend? No, I was very oh. surprised. Surprised too. Board's really getting out of hand here, though. If you're sitting in John's seat, he's trying to come up with a way to finish the game. He attacks with the Terramanders. But he's just sitting with his arms folded in front as Marcio lines up his attacks. And what does he have? It's not attacks, not it's attacks. actually a defensive play. Yeah. He, he's, he's scared for his life here on eight life. Uh, he can't take too much more damage in the air. Yeah, he's actually tapping those for Conclave Tribunal to take down the Tempest Gen on the other side of the battlefield. That means he's only going to get in for a couple of damage with that Knight, but he is setting up a massive attack next turn. And next turn is... Uh, That's devastating. Almost every creature is lethal. Like If you let through two creatures on that board, you're definitely taking lethal. Yeah, you definitely did. Uh, two marshals and a history going off. Wow. Yeah, and that's going to be the handshake. So Marcio Carvalho, a great start to his Pro Tour, a 2-0 victory over the GOAT. And we can go back to table one, Reed Duke and Rob Pisano. Reed certainly made that a game after that Mulligan situation. But uh, as you predicted quite deftly there, Simon, it was actually Rob who was in a fine position later on. And he ended up winning. Mm. It is uh, now, once again, a six-card hand, I believe, for Duke. It, it did look like it, yep. It is indeed. Duressius. Let's mm. see what's going on in Reed's remaining five cards, says Rob Pisano. Perhaps a spell pierce from Duke, as he is considering his options. Yep. Yeah, he's going to cast spell pierce. Actually, uh, there's something funny. If you scry after mulliganing, you don't want to opt on turn one. If you kept the card on top, it's kind of a waste of a card if you do. Mm -hmm. And um, while we're at that, we're now looking at the first sideboard game of this matchup. Something that is very counterintuitive is that you don't want to be the one countering uh, on the Esper control side. You won't just want to be removing, 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 and running mono blue tempo out of threats. Okay. So, because if you think about it, having an absorb in your hand is fine to deal with a threat when the board is at parity. But against mono blue, you're almost never at parity. You're always behind. And when you're behind, counter magic is at its worst. And this has been interesting because while that's generally true, it certainly hasn't been in this match. Reed has just not had those typical starts for this deck where they play a one-drop evasive threat looking to play that curious obsession on it. Reed's, Reed's draws have not been great. No. Uh, he's, made, he's made a tremendous game out of it in game one. We'll see how it how it uh, ends up working out here for him. Um, th this is, of course, the downside of playing a tempo a tempo deck like this. If you don't get the tempo early on, it becomes very difficult to fight for the board again, because ultimately this is maybe the only deck in the format that is playing cards that you wouldn't call great in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. it, it's really one of the decks that is that is synergy based rather than uh, rather than power level based in this format and kaya orzov usurper is going to do work on this board because Reed just had to play two one drops into it mm -hmm. 
So and you can one see of them's gone. Pisano is super proactive, right? Yes. It's like proactive card after proactive card. Yeah, look card. at his graveyard and board. Yeah. yeah. Perfect curve. Take a card from you, kill one of your creatures, kill one of your creatures, steal one of your creatures. And uh, Teza can minus on uh, can minus on Curious Obsession, which plays around Dive Down. Hostage Taker plays around Negate. You have all these all these little things to kind of break the flow, the state of flow that the Monogo Tempo deck is in. Terramander, 5-5 five, five on your side of the board. I'll tell you what, the state of flow from Reed Duke's perspective is right down the drain because he just can't get anything going here against Rob. Rob is making short work of Reed here in game number two and making a real stand to be undefeated 8-0 and o coming out of day one. Regardless of the outcome of this particular match, both players are going to have a, a really good start, but boy, undefeated has a nice ring to it, mm -hmm. does it not? Yeah, and, and of course, Duke would have loved to be to be 8-0. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not only playing for himself, he's also playing for pro points for the team series. But if we take a step back, if you, would, if you tell anyone at this event that they will be 7-1 at the end of the day, you don't get any complaints. Right, they'd be thrilled. This is insulting, though. Look at what Rob's done. He's stolen the Terramander and now adapted it, and he's killing Reed with his own Terramander. Uh, this shocking um, behavior from Rob Pisano. <laughs> none of these, um, none of these two games have been the, the archetypical uh, way this matchup plays out, especially game two. I think game one, we actually saw it. it Did he just, just kill him? He just oh. ultimated Kaya for lethal. <laughs> and that's going to do it. <laughs> Rob Pisano playing Esper Aggro somehow <laughs> removes every threat, steals one of them, and even kills him with the Planeswalker and says, sends Reed Duke packing. But, again, a really great finish to the day one for Reed. So for Reed Duke fans, fret not. He's still in a good position. But, boy, Rob Pisano, you should be smiling, buddy, because you are 8-0 at the Mythic Championship here in Cleveland and really doing it in impressive fashion as well. Not on easy mode here. I mentioned earlier, but round five, you played against Brian Brown Dewin. Then round seven, it was Chapin. These are all in the feature match. I don't even know who he played in six because he wasn't in the feature, but and then he played against Reed Duke in this round. And that is a tough, tough road. Oh, looks like we have a handshake here. And that was Michael Bonde doing the same thing Finally handing Autumn Burchett her first loss. And <laughs> that's, uh, again, two players with great finishes to start. And that's an 8-0 celebration for Honda. Ah. 8-0 with Simic Nexus. Uh, Burchett, 7-1 with one of Blue Temple. So that is really fantastic start from both of these players as well. And you saw the excitement from Michael. He gave a little bit of a fist pump there at the end. Like, Ugh, it feels good. My Michael plays with, with all his heart. He, he deeply cares. Yeah, and I noticed also that Autumn, they're also playing that mono blue deck, so it's doing very well at the top of the tables. Three in the feature match area. Wow. Four tables, three of them filled with just Reed Duke, Burchett, Finkel. Yeah, on mono you know, blue. just the usual. So really good stuff for the mono blue deck. We're going to, be, of course, be keeping an eye on that and how the metagame shifts as we work our way into day number two because... That's where everything changed. We have 499 deck lists that we went through and broke down. You saw some of the graphics earlier today that kind of tell the tale of what people thought was going to be good coming in. And then we get to see what's actually good tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, of course, a bit of a curveball thrown in because the limited rounds also determine how well you get to do in this tournament. Th those 8-0s and 7-1s are not possible if you scrub out in draft. Yeah, that's right. All right, well, we've got uh, Rich, Marie, and Paul at the news desk to kind of wrap things up for the day. But first, a short break.
Hey everybody, welcome back to the news desk. Maria and Rich hanging out with you here. And BDM is on the floor with Reed Duke, who we just saw in the feature match area. All right, Brian David Marshall here on the floor with Magic Pro League member Reed Duke. Reed, we tried to talk a little earlier in the day, but uh, we get to finish that conversation now. Uh, pretty good day for Team Ultimate Guard. Yeah, we're, we're definitely happy. Um, I don't know how some of my teammates did in the final round. I just finished playing myself, but we have uh, you know people in striking distance of a top eight with a good day tomorrow, so can never complain about that. One of those people within striking distance is one Reed Duke, who finishes the day seven and one. Uh, talk to me about uh, this this mono blue deck. This the, the draft deck also <laughs> didn't seem like a Reed Duke deck to me. This this does not seem like the typical weapon of choice for one Reed Duke. What attracted you to this deck? Uh, well, it's true that I'm definitely outside my comfort zone, but in some sense, I, I welcome the challenge, right? Um, but yeah, you know, it's funny you ask this question because two weeks ago. I would have said mono blue, it, it's a gimmick deck, right? You know, like, okay, curious obsession, dive down, haha, ha, we all get the joke. But um, what happened was we, we met up to, uh, to practice and William Jensen showed up with his fully sleeved mono blue deck that he'd been playing on MTG Arena and just no one could beat him with anything, not with white, not with red, not with control, not with Sultai. Um, and part of that is just William Jetson is one of the best players in, in the history of the game. But, but part of it is this blue deck is actually just a really good multi-dimensional deck. I mean, yes, you get the free wins with Curious Obsession, but also you have Tempest Jin is a super strong card. The counter spells are great. So um, when I learned that this deck actually can uh, play like interesting, intricate games and can actually beat some of those tougher matchups, I, I just decided it was the deck to play. Is it, is it fair to say sometimes it feels like a deck that you would play in an older format? Like it, it plays almost like a Merfolk deck would in some of the older formats or, or some of those other tempo decks that yep. I, I don't want to compare it to Delver, but kind of Delver-ish. No, it's, it's a really good comparison. I mean, one of the advantages of this deck is that we're playing standard, but my deck has, what, like 19 one-mana spells, potentially even even more 21 one-mana spells in it, and uh, everyone else's, their deck is about five and six mana plays, so that's a huge advantage in and of itself. If I can make my one-mana card trade for your four-mana card, that's like, you know, bread and butter way to win at Magic. Um, I, I saw that on a tip <laughs> screen on Ma an MTG Arena. It said, yeah. you know, if you your cheaper spell can trade for a more expensive spell, that's mana advantage. Yeah, I mean, it, that works on at the, the, <laughs> the on day one when you learn to play Magic, and it works on year 20 when you've been playing for, for your whole life. Um, but yeah, your, your comparison is great, the older formats, especially with the new printing of Terramander, which is a card that you can slip in uh, early and protect it with counter magic, and then in the late game when you need it, it becomes a huge threat. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, and again, you guys crushed draft. I believe as a team, you had fewer losses than Ben Stark as an individual in that first draft. Wow, well, that's got to feel really good, and I'm, I'm very pleased that you phrased it that way, Brian. <laughs> All right, uh, Reed Duke, go, uh, go enjoy the, the post day one recap with the team. Great job, and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing what you guys cook up and draft tomorrow here at Mythic Championship Cleveland. So I've got to be honest, Maria. Yeah. I was a little concerned for Brian David Marshall's future ability to interview Ben Stark after <laughs> that. And then I thought, probably doesn't have to worry, does he? Oh, single tear. Sick. Yeah. Um, so um, here we are as we're heading down the stretch of round number eight. The two eight and O's are, of course, Rob Pisano uh, and Michael Bonder. We'll hear from Michael Bonder in just a minute or two, all being well. Um, but then seven and ones, are, most of them are going to be in the first draft pod in the morning. But one or two maybe will slip down to represent the, the start of the second draft pod. Um, so... We've got a list of the seven ones coming in here. William Jensen, of course, who's been on top of the standings as we go along seven and one. Joe So of Malaysia, who we haven't mentioned much uh, on the stream thus far, is up to seven and one. Plenty of coverage of Marcio Carvalho. Hear more from him in just a minute. He's going to do a deck tech for us. Uh, Reed Duke, you just heard from at seven and one. Fabrizio and Terry, back from a prolonged absence, is at seven and one. Venezuela, England, uh, currently in England. Michael Bonder, though, Maria, I think, may be ready, do you reckon? Mm. Yeah, I think he might. Let's find out. BDM's down on the floor with him right now. One last Mythic Championship for me to mangle European names. I'm here with Michael Bunda <laughs> of... Uh, Michael, have you ever gone 8-0 day one of a Pro Tour or Mythic Championship before? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've imagined it. I have uh, dreamed about it. I've seen it happen for other people. And I have really been hoping 
but it has never happened. So is it was did it not feel as good as you'd imagined it would feel? I think it's uh, it's beyond amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm pretty happy right now. Yeah. Now uh, tell me tell me how we, how we got here. What, what was your plan going into the draft? How how did the draft work out for you? Uh, so I. The, the draft didn't work out for me. I, I haven't drafted that much, and I got stuck in three colors with no guild gates. Uh, so I did the old invasion uh, mana base. Uh, seven, six, seven, six, three. five. Oh, uh, seven, 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 three. three. Yeah, okay, that's good better old. than six, six, five. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, but it just like it worked out, and uh, eventually my uh, Rakdos splash uh, three green cards uh, took it to, to a three zero. And then in constructed, I'm I'm playing Nexus, uh, the Simic Nexus. And I've just been doing unfair things like the entire day, and just been—I've been really unfortunate with my matchups, but I've been very fortunate with my success in those matchups. So, so I beat two mono blue, one mono red, and one uh, mono white. So uh, <laughs> it should be just bad uh, matchups on paper, but uh, yeah, I mean the the decks where it's all ba one kind of basic land are not the best matchups for this deck, right? No, no, uh, it can be like kind of hard because they. Two of the of the three decks have a lot of reach, and then they just kill you by turn five. So even though you get to resolve the reclamation, everything just has to go right from that point. But yeah, it did. So uh, and now I'm here. What what were you hoping to face? What when you when you decided to play this deck? What was your uh, prediction? What were you anticipating that would be your good matchup uh, in this event? Um, I wrote to Marcio and uh, Lucas uh, Patro in our like team chat. And uh, I told them, if I draw my lands and if I draw a uh, growth spiral on turn two, I think I can do well like against my opponents. Uh, but I just want to play against Sultai. Uh, <laughs> and just like uh, fair decks, uh, gate decks, and maybe also the mirror even. Um, but I also just want to play the turn two land and growth spiral and get to four lands on turn three. And so those two plans like combined, it is what has been happening today. And it okay. was... Uh, the hopeful plan. So everything has been aligned, and yeah, I just I couldn't imagine a better result. All right. Well, Michael, great job uh, going 8 0, and uh, nice way to kick off these Mythic Championships here for you. Yeah. Uh, good luck and have uh, fun tonight, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, BDM. Well, let's find out what other players are at 7-1, and one, a fantastic record to end day one here, Rich. Yeah, I was really interested in that interview because sometimes you see people win Pro Tours and they can't believe it and they're really shell-shocked. Wonder looks like that at the end of day one. I'll be very interested to see, yeah. you know, that he's got 12, 13 hours between now when he has to sit down and draft again. But when you sit down at 0-0, zero, zero, he's such a happy guy. And he, he looked under a lot of pressure there, which is not what you necessarily expect. But then most of us can only dream of going 8-0 no, on day one of a, an event with Absolutely. You know, 50,000 first prize. Anyway, some more 7-1s and ones for you. Uh, Chichen Ye, Peter Ye, uh, is at 7-1. and one. Yoshihiko Ikawa of Japan, 7-1. and one. Uh, And Petr Sahurik. Now, wh why do we know Petr Sahurik apart from, you know, he's got some Grand Prix tomates, but um, more, more than that. Yeah, he's got a phenomenal win percentage rate at Pro Tours Mythic Championships, just head and shoulders above most of the field. Here, In right? standard, specifically. In standard. Right. Yeah. Um, so he's doing terrifically. Sebastian Pozzo, uh, you mentioned, who literally, that's the first time I've seen seen him going through yeah. the results uh, segment. He's 7-1. and one. Austin Clark in his first Mythic event uh, is at 7-1. and one. Piotr Glugowski of the MPL. And we also have a Pro Tour champion who we haven't seen at the top of the standings for a while. That's our Relax uh, at 7-1. and one. And then, Maria, t tell us about former Draft Master. Yeah, Elias Wattsfeldt at 7-1 and one, and uh, obviously doing well in draft to get himself that record. So coming back tomorrow, going to be happy to start things off with the draft again. Yeah, now the one other person I do want to mention to you is someone down at 5-3, and three, which is not a fantastic record, but of course it means they get to come back on day two. But that's Brad Nelson, and he began 0-3 along with Ben Stark. He was the other 0-3 MPL drafter this morning of the 32. Eight winners, uh, 16 2-1s, 6 1-2s, and, and two 0-3s. But Brad Nelson, one of the best standard players ever, went from 0-3 to 5-3, and now we'll try and go through what hopefully will be an a fair draft pod at 5 3. <laughs> yeah. And try and get out of that at 8 and 3, and then woe betide anyone who's left in his way in standard. I saw him tweet out a picture of his draft deck. 
It was bad. Was it not? Was it not the it was value? Not good. Okay. <laughs> Well, someone who is extremely good and is in the MPL is Marcio Carvalho with a phenomenal career uh, behind him and indeed very likely ahead of him. He's over at the video wall with Paul Chion for another Deck Tech.